irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to L.A. Talk Radio. You're listening to Female Filmmakers Fuse with Alexa Polar only on L.A. Talk Radio. Thank you for listening to Female Filmmakers Fuse podcast. I'm your host, Alexa Polar. Robin Pabello is not here today. She's working on a shoot right now, so that's good for her. Um, if you want to call in today, the number, well, every Sunday is the same number. It's 818-602-4929. Again, that's 818-602-4929. Don't forget to follow us on our social media, Female Filmmakers Fuse and Female Filmmakers Fuse podcast. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. We put the shows that we have here on the podcast on YouTube because we find that it makes it easier to share on social media. Today, our special, fantastic guest is Jackie Blue. Hi, Jackie. Hi. That's a really cool name. Thank you. I just said that before we started, but I wanted to say it again on air. Um, is that your that's your name name or is that a stage name? Stage name. It's a yeah, stage name, and it's after a song because I love music. Music is my favorite thing in the world. I wish I could create it, uh -huh. but I can't. One of my kids is a musician. So. Okay, that's I like it though. Jackie Blue, yeah. very very cool. Very you know I like it, and it's very fitting. Yes. I we've only talked for a few minutes, but still I I, I sense the Jackie Blue in you. <laughs> Thank um, you. Jackie, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you do? Because I, I saw that you do hypnotherapy as well. Yeah. That's, so that's I interesting. Do, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. um, I like to paint and photograph. I'm a filmmaker. My passion is in directing and writing. Okay. Um, I edit and produce also, but I really love directing and writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also do hypnotherapy. I just graduated with honors from the Hypnosis Motivation Institute. It was a wonderful if you're interested in the subconscious mind and mm -hmm. the human psyche and why and how we develop into who we are, mm -hmm. then it, it was a really fascinating program. Um, they're located over in Tarzana, and they do offer free classes to the public. Oh, that's cool. So it's, it's something that, you know, for a lot of people in our industry, um, writers, if you get writer's block, hypnotherapy can really kind of help you get into your own subconscious and just kind of play with your own imagination a little bit. So mm -hmm. it can really help with writer's block. It can also help with stage fright. A lot of actors and actresses use hypnotherapy to help them to either get into the mindset of a character mm -hmm. or to help them just overcome their own, their own fears that might be holding them back. So yeah, and anxiety, it's really great. It's really great, I found it's a really great tool for a lot of things. Um, and do you use it to help other um, people in the industry, other females, and, and you know? Yeah, actually, I really, um, I just launched my practice in January, mm -hmm. and I've worked with a couple female filmmakers, and so on the DL, I guess <laughs> I'll say it here since we're on Female Filmmaker Fuse, right. but because I'm also a female filmmaker, and I understand how hard this industry is, and I think just just how difficult it can be can give us all anxiety and self-doubt. Mm -hmm. um, that I want to give a discount and offer my services to female filmmakers specifically, not only, but right. but because I understand, I understand the extra added anxiety and frustration and and self doubt that we can get just from all the rejection. I right. feel like that's the hardest thing to deal with is the rejection. Absolutely, and it was great. Um, uh, the Thursday and Friday we had a uh, our second annual uh, film festival. We started with a panel. Um, the turnout was really great. Uh, we, I mean, we went from a little tiny baby to like, it, it just grew. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was really overwhelming for myself and for Robin because we started this and, and to see all these women come together. And there were a lot of men there too supporting, which was fantastic. Our, um, Robert Michael was, uh, the moderator for the panel we I, I know him for years he's a fantastic talented actor he's also a composer and and so that's what it's about it's not just about ex it's not about excluding men right. and that's what we wanted to showcase we just want to make it a, a, an equal playing field exactly. you know and it was a uh, overwhelming uh, for us to see the support that these uh, individuals gave towards each other, towards one another. Like it was just great, and the advice, the panel was great. The film festival was uh, overall success. I, you know, we look forward to next year. 
Um, but I did want to mention that. And so I totally understand what, what you mean by that. Cause I could see that, um, that it, it would help, uh, yeah. you know, and I could see a lot of, uh, you know, men and women wanting to be interested in that, you know, to, to get that extra needed assistance with blocking or, um, anxiety especially because we get it all the time oh yeah you know yeah and especially when you know when you look at the amount of depression Mm -hmm. and suicide that we have in our industry Mm -hmm. i feel when people and not advocating that hypnotherapists work with suicide because they can't legally you have to go to a psychiatrist or psychologist for that but um i feel like the amount of depression or anxiety that might lead somebody to suicide Mm -hmm. could be minimalized with learning coping mechanisms right. and learning just little little tricks like journaling and stuff, you yeah. know? Um, and I actually, it's really funny because I was at a, a Steve Harvey, my mom came to town and uh, we went to go see Family Feud, a live taping. I took her to okay. that. Okay, <laughs> that's um, cool. Yeah, whenever family comes in from out of town, you gotta like, tape them do to something. do something yeah. that they never <laughs> get to do. So we went to do that and at the end, Steve Harvey had this really great um, speech that he gave to the audience. Mm-hmm. And, one of the things that he said was um, every night before he goes to bed, he writes in a journal, like the different things that he wants. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like he asks God and he writes it down. And and that was one of the things that we learned in hypnotherapy school was before you go to bed, write down uh, your goals mm-hmm. uh, and what it is that you're working on. And kind of like saying positive affirmations, but just writing it in. And so it goes into your subconscious mm. and and when, just learning about the subconscious, I think, is really fascinating. So I think it's done wonders for me personally. Mm-hmm. And I would love to show other people just the different avenues their own minds can take them down because it's, I don't know, it's fun. and Yeah, yeah. It, uh, extremely helpful. I know that one of my uh, biggest fears, and I'm not talking about because I know if Robin's listening, she she or was here, she'd probably say bridges and uh reptiles which yes those are my physical big fears but one of my fears um and uh, because i was asked once is failure and ironically it's not my own failure it's the failure to let down other people so Ah. especially in a production i i write and direct as well and so my fear is to not do well not for myself is that i'm going to let everyone else down that's working so hard on this project that i'm the captain of because when you're the director that's pretty much what you are and i have that fear of letting down the investors that put money towards you know something that i put together or that i'm directing so i have that fear i have a fear of letting down my crew the talent the producers like all the people involved my parents like it's like it's an overwhelming amount of fear and stress that i carry but it's a failure of letting them down a failing this project or whatever project i have to be on for them like i don't want to let them down i want to uh, succeed so that they can succeed that that it's successful in so the investors can make their money back so that you know everyone's prideful of this project and say yes i worked on that so that's right. my fear does that make sense yeah totally that's that's like the weight of the world because you feel like you have so many people depending on you and right. your personal success that oh my god that's an overwhelming amount of stress yeah, yeah absolutely yeah and i had to find a way to phrase it because someone when i said that when i said failure they're like oh everyone's afraid of failure i was like no i don't think i'm saying and i was like no you know what let me say it this way because it wasn't my personal failure if i failed and i fail and i I learn you know right. and i it's kind of like okay that's it's letting i'll get over yeah it's letting the down the weight of the world and yeah that's a exactly. lot of pressure because yeah. other yeah it's a, it's a lot of pressure and i think that a lot of the executives in this industry probably mm-hmm. feel that as well mm-hmm. because because when you take into account how many people work on a production any pick any tv show stab in the dark any tv show any major motion picture and you look at how many people work on that mm-hmm. and those are people's livelihoods so yeah. that's their rent that's their food that's mm-hmm. their family that's their kids college you know so that's a lot of pressure if a movie flops and you have all these people that are like oh no what do we you know i mean yeah. that's that's a lot of pressure yeah, so, it is and I, I and and we're just talking on like the small independent scale right so the larger the gets the more the pressure is absolutely yeah. um and you say you write and direct. Yeah. Do you have anything out right now? Or are you working on anything right now? So right now I have a, my second documentary okay. is in post-production. Um, I'm going to host a focus screening next month in December. So awesome. I would okay. love to have you guys there. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Um, 
but it's on it's actually on suicide okay and uh, one of the stars featured in my film is Jared Padalecki from Supernatural okay um, it was right around the time that I decided I was going to do a documentary on the subject mm -hmm. he had started his always fighting campaign that same month mm -hmm. um, and I happen to be working on a feature film called The Last Train, which was directed by a, a woman named Tracy Pellegrino. Mm -hmm. And she's married to the guy who plays Lucifer on Supernatural. Okay. So I went to her and I said to her during production, I said, oh, I'm doing a documentary on suicide that is actually inspired by the movie we're working on that she was directing. Mm -hmm. um, and I said to her, and, and one of the guys on Supernatural, he mm -hmm. just started an anti-suicide campaign would you be able to maybe get word to him? Maybe he would be interested in speaking in my film. Mm -hmm. And that was in March that I had said that to her. And I didn't hear back until November. Mm -hmm. But in November, I got a quick message from her saying, Jared's in town, and he's almost never in town because he lives in Texas and they shoot in Canada. Okay, wow. So <laughs> it's very rare that the Supernatural guys are actually in L.A. In L.A., yeah. Um, and so yeah, she sent a quick message um, exchange contact information and we ended up getting him in like he fit us in between meeting the writers at mm -hmm. WB and flying out at LAX so we got like 45 minutes right in between that uh, he was a really great guy really great interview um, but really passionate about the subject matter yeah and a hip-hop artist named tones he's known for his work in justified okay um, he reached out to me. He'd heard about the film through someone who was working with him, and he reached out to me wanting to be a part of this project. Mm -hmm. um, and then I reached out to Kevin Briggs, who he's uh, he's an author and a former California State Highway Patrol officer who talked over 200 people out of jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. So... I talked to all these people, and, and I talked, I reached out to other pe non-famous, regular, everyday people mm -hmm. who have been affected by suicide. Mm -hmm. Either they themselves um, have attempted suicide, or they've lost somebody that they love to suicide. Mm -hmm. um, it took me three and a half years to get to the point that I'm at, but mm -hmm. right now it's with the composer. Okay. Uh, and I wanted, it was really important to me to end it on a positive note, because right. it is such a heavy subject. Um, but deep down, I am and always have been an optimist. So even when things are at their absolute worst, somewhere in the back of my head, there's always a little voice saying, okay, how can we, what can we do? Right. How can we make it better? Right. Um, somehow light will prevail. So right. just got to find out how. Right. Um, so I really wanted to, and that, that's something I struggled with. How do you take a film on suicide and end it on a positive note? How do you, after, you know, there's parts of this film that, as many times as I've sat, watched it through editing, mm -hmm. when you're editing, you sit and a lot of times you get desensitized. You hear the same story yeah. over and over again. There are some stories in this film, I could listen to it a hundred times and I'm still not desensitized to it. It's still at the it's screening, very I have to have tear, uh, little tissues for everybody. Yeah. Um, because it, but it's meant to have that effect. And, and mm -hmm. I also really wanted to make it inclusive. So it does talk about LGBT and it does talk about military. So mm -hmm. People who are anti one or the other are going to have to get over that to watch this film the way it's meant to be watched mm -hmm. because because suicide affects everybody right. and it affects people who are right wing and left wing. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter where your political lean leanings are or what country on the planet you live in or were born in because suicide affects everybody. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that I I wanted to talk about the history. I wanted to talk about. Um, as much as I could cover, um, Dr. Jack Kevorkian and okay. suicide cults and, mm -hmm. you know, the right to die and death with dignity and the difference between that and, you know, putting a gun in your mouth. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just, it was a really heavy thing. So three years later, <laughs> uh, it's finally with Bruce Whitkin, who's doing the score. He's a Grammy-nominated producer and That's musician. Amazing. That's amazing. What's the name of the, the project? What's it gonna It's be? called I Chose Life, Stories of Suicide and Survival. And the website is www.ichoselife.org. 
I chose life film.com that's amazing so, i'm gonna yeah. check it out i would love to be there to watch it yeah that as soon as i get the sound back from bruce i'm going to set up the screening and yeah. i will definitely reach out to you and yes um, anyone please. who's listening if you're listening and you are interested in going to the screening just go to the website www.ichoselifefilm.com and click on the um subscribe for updates i will be sending out um an email as soon as i do have that information set and anybody who's local that expresses interest in being there mm -hmm. i would welcome to have there yeah absolutely that is a very very heavy heavy topic and it's something that we get reminder uh of every so often depending on you know someone of stature that takes their life and and then everyone goes through the whole shock like they're always happy they're always this and it's of course um, I, you know, I, I have my own struggles with that as well. And so I totally understand. And, and one of the things I, I discuss with other people, cause you mentioned guns, mm -hmm. I say, I, I don't, I'm not an anti-gun person. So I'm not that person that says that take all guns away. Right. I'm saying there should be more restrictions. There should be more like if we have to always have, you know, update our driver's license and sometimes we have to go in and do the test again. And sometimes they have to run another, you know, check up on us or whatever, because they make changes now if you want to travel. Right. Why can't it be the same for a gun? If someone is having those thoughts, has been in the hospital, um, has their doctors, they should be able to input in the system and say, hey, this person has had thoughts of suicide. That should come up. And then they should see that if they go to buy a gun or something and say like, okay, you know what, we're whatever you got to say to tell them like we're not going to be able to sell you again right now mm -hmm. you know i don't think there's anything wrong with that right you no, know i fully agree because people who deal with mental illness mm -hmm. um they don't always they're not in the right headspace so mm -hmm. if someone is in a manic episode they might not really want to kill themselves mm -hmm. but because they're in such a panicked mode or a manic mode or they're, whatever is stressing them out, they just can't handle at that moment. Mm -hmm. It could be a heat of the moment thing that they didn't mean to do. Right. Um, and in fact, it's really one of the things that I've found through talking to people about the subject is a lot of people who attempt suicide, they didn't actually want to die. Yeah. Like seconds after they attempted, they were, it was instant regret. Like, yeah. Exactly. Now I want to live. In yeah. fact, the guy, um, Anthony Montez, who, he wrote and starred in The Last Train, which is the movie that I was being I was working as a PA on mm -hmm. when I decided to do this documentary. Mm -hmm. um, the full story of how that came to be is in the director's statement on the website, so you can check that out. Okay. But um, but yeah, he he actually jumped in front of a subway train in New York, and oh. his intent was to kill himself. And as soon as he jumped and hit the rails, he had that oh crap, I don't want to do this moment. Um, mm -hmm. He thought of his mother and he didn't want to do that to her. And so he pulled himself up and he ended up surviving. Mm -hmm. But but then the more people I talked to who had made attempts on their lives had similar things where in the moment that's what they were feeling and wanted and as soon as they made that decision, mm -hmm. it was, oh, instant regret. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder how many people that jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge had that moment of instant regret because mm -hmm. um, you know there was also a documentary called the bridge where it's basically just you see 24 people I, i've seen it yeah that's and, harsh um, yeah yeah and it, it followed some of their lives and like one woman was schizophrenic and so maybe she didn't actually want to die she was mm -hmm. just whatever was whatever she was dealing with that day got to be too much mm -hmm. but had she made it through that day it, tomorrow could have been much better Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what a lot of people who are dealing with mental illness, if they happen to have a gun on hand, they might just be making a snap decision that they're not thinking about um, that's not really what they want to do. So I absolutely agree with you. I don't yeah. think I and I, you know, I have people in my family who are who are heavily into guns and then mm -hmm. it kind of goes like all over the place. My main thing is I don't want people to hurt themselves or, or other people. Yeah. <laughs> so that's you know there i think we have a big problem in our country with um over medicating and i think that those mm -hmm. medications are messing with people's psychology yeah. there's a story in my documentary 
The woman shares the story about her brother. Um, he, you know, she talks about who he was before he had knee surgery. Mm -hmm. And after knee surgery, he had lost his job, had knee surgery, and the doctors put him on opiates. And she said after he started taking the opiates, he got addicted to them. He became a completely different person. He started stockpiling weapons. Mm -hmm. He was angry that he had lost his job. And mm -hmm. he, he ended up taking his life. But before that, he had collected, he had a, an arsenal of like 20 weapons in his basement. But wow. he, she felt that he might have been planning something much worse right. than only taking his life. And that's when I, when she said this and I was listening to the story and I'm editing the documentary, it just kind of clicked in my head with all of these shootings and all of these different things that are happening in our country, whether mm -hmm. it's people shooting themselves or shooting other people, mm -hmm. how much of it is related to mental illness not being treated properly mm -hmm. or these medications that we're giving for pain or other issues that are messing, messing. with our neurology. Mm -hmm. And it really started making me think, like, we have to, as a country, as a nation, we have to address this. And I feel like documentary films can be really important because they can be good conversation starters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I hope at the very least that this film will, will do that and open up some conversations that our country, our country's in crisis. And oh, yeah. It, it breaks my heart every it's, day. <laughs> it's scary. It's, it's scary. really scary. Um, too much, um, I think I, I blame a lot of it on money. Because, like, yeah, Big Pharma, they have their hands in a lot of it. Uh, I remember, and it's funny because my brother, Dennis, brought this to my attention one day. He's like, do you remember when we were kids? He's like, how many commercials that you see about medicine? Like, this this medication and all this stuff, and go see your doctor and ask about this med. He's like, how many commercials did you see about medication? And I was like, none. And he was like, yeah. Isn't that a trip that now we're adults and that you, like every other commercial is about some sort of medication that treats this, this and that, but here are the warnings mm -hmm. really quick. And then here's another, you know, commercial about another, med he's like, they have so much money they're advertising and they're getting in our heads that we might need this, you know, because it became like a fear where it, it's kind of like an, it, like a joke, you know, don't go to WebMD because then you're going to self-diagnose yourself and you're going to find the worst things and you're totally fine. Yeah. You know, so if people aren't doing that anymore, you know, then let's put it in their face. Like, let's put it on uh, the social media commercials that come up, the advertisement that come up, the, com the commercials on TV that, you know. So you're seeing it more and more, and you're thinking, like, I, I think I do have those symptoms, you know. And it's ironic because um, I, I have this thing where I'm always shaking my legs, like, I, like, like, a, like a nervous thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't need treatment for it. I just know, like, I, as soon as I notice I'm doing it, I stop. You know, and it's just like one of those. I'm a very anxious person. I, I have, I know I have low so, self esteem. I deal with it my own way that I can. So when I am aware of it, I do other things. Like, um, so that's one of the things that I would would joke with my family. I'm like, I have a, a shake a leg or a restless leg syndrome, and I literally said that. And and many years later, there was a medication for restless leg syndrome. And I was like, what the heck? Like, that's an actual thing, you know? And I don't, I don't know if it is, but I'm, I'm not taking it. I'm totally fine. But people are going to see that and think I need to take that medication because I have the same thing. Yeah. So it's a very, very scary, scary thing to see that, um, they own a lot of it. You go to the hospital. My mom has, I don't know how many medications and one medication is doing harm on something else. So now she has to do another medication to take care of that other thing. And that thing harms yep. another thing. So it's a, it's a vicious, spiral. vicious circle. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. And I feel bad cause she doesn't want to take the medication anymore, you know, but she's at that point where she needs it. There's certain things that she can't be without. Right. You and know? that's where I feel like this is where this is where it kind of gets to like muddy waters with mm -hmm. that because you know on one hand like I know for a fact big pharma is what kept my grandfather alive for mm -hmm. 85 years and I wouldn't have had like he had an angioplasty he had all these health mm -hmm. issues he had to be dependent on big pharma but because of the medications we had him for 85 years mm -hmm. and for that I'm so thankful on the other hand I see you know they're over medicating for everything it's Oh, things that we used to treat with diet, we mm -hmm. now treat with a pill. Yep. Things that we used to, you know, treat with just regular. I, I still turn to my, this is what I love about my grandmother. My grandmother is 91. 
has the her health problems are she has a little arthritis, mm -hmm. which is wear and tear for being ninety one years old, mm -hmm. and she's hard of hearing. Again, wear and tear wear and for tear. being ninety one yeah. years old. <laughs> but that's it. She doesn't have major health problems. She's ninety one. She has no cancer, no kidney failure, no heart disease, that's no amazing. you know. And when I looked at her life and I looked at my mom's life and I'm like, what? What's going on? Because my mom's had cancer twice. My dad died of cancer. So uh -huh. I look at my parents and I look at my grandmother. And I'm like, well, what is she doing and what are they doing? And my mom is on a lot of different medications. Mm -hmm. My mom eats regular conventional food. My grandmother has always eaten, and I guess she's kind of like ahead of her times. She was a vegan in Florida mm -hmm. long before I ever knew. I remember being like really little and she had stickers that would talk about uh, cow milk for cows and breast milk for humans. And I didn't really understand what that yeah. meant at the mm -hmm. time, but that went into my subconscious and my psychology. And uh, later on when I was older, I became a vegan and in Florida, it's not like LA mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> LA, you have vegans left and right, it's no big deal, whatever, everyone knows what a vegan is. In Florida, and I'm talking also like, 20 years ago mm -hmm. when I became vegan. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, nobody knew what it was. It was very hard. And, and so I dealt with a lot of crap about it. My grandmother was, like, vegan ahead of her times, but she also didn't take a lot of big pharma. Mm -hmm. I remember going with her to the doctors, and um, she would say, okay, you diagnose me, but then I'm going to go home and treat me. Mm -hmm. And she would treat herself with herbs, Eastern medication. I remember yeah. she was the first person who taught me about acupuncture and mm -hmm. acupressure. And and that's what she's always done. So she kind of like she uses Western medicine to diagnose her, mm -hmm. uh, and then she'll take you know their vitamins or whatever. But then everything else that she does is um, she follows a lot of Eastern and holistic ways. And I look at her health and I compare it to my mom's health, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I don't want cancer. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna follow her. She yeah. knows what she's doing. Right. <laughs> but it's it is scary when I. It's funny because those big pharma ads that you're talking about, mm -hmm. they've even like seeped into my YouTube videos. Yep. I try to watch like music videos and put it on those autoplay loops yeah. and it'll like force me to watch, to watch those this. commercials. And my kids are funny because um, there's a band called No Effects and they're one of our favorite bands and they did a music video with Funny or Die. Mm -hmm. And it is the song is called Oxymoronic, <laughs> and it is a complete mock on Big Pharma. And yeah. Fat Mike did the play on words and everything. Mm -hmm. It's so like I love that song. It's so great. But at the end of it, it's like a complete mock on Big Pharma, and they even do it the way the ads are talking about um, what it may cause. And yeah, it may cause severe whatever. Yeah, uh, licking windows or whatever. Right. It says. <laughs> so now, whenever my kids hear the real Big Pharma ads, because they're used to that song and it mocking Big Pharma. Uh -huh. So between our music videos, when they have those Big Pharma ads, my kids have like, is that real? <laughs> Do people actually, it just said it, it might cause stroke, heart attack, yeah. death, and people take that? Like, yeah. or you gotta love the ones that are, um, the antidepressants that oh, yeah. might cause suicidal Suicide. feelings. That's what? the weirdest thing. Yes, yes. I, that and it it bothers me when I hear that. But my kids have gotten. They're like you know, my youngest kid has just turned ten, and my oldest are twins that are fifteen. Mm -hmm. So they're you know at those ages, and they're they turn around and they're like, "Is this even real? Yeah. Is this real life? Like, yeah, cat. Yeah. This is sorry. This is what our society is. This is what our society and, is. And that's part of the problem too. Is that um. I, I there's some doctors I wish they would go back to their oath, mm -hmm. okay? Because they that's where I'm saying like money comes into play. Because yes. big pharma pays a lot of bonuses and all this stuff. So you go to the doctor's office and you have all this advertisement. That's what it is. Like I'm sponsoring you as a doctor. Here's all my medication. Give it to your client, your 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 clients, your your patients. I mean, and so it's insane that that's what that's become. Right. And a doctor could look at you and say, and I, I've, I've seen it where there's some doctors that are really true and really good. And they're like, yeah, this is what we're sponsored. Don't take this. Here's what I recommend. Or here's some natural ways to do it. That's what they should do because there, there is a different route. There's not just a medic, not to just medicate. There's right. other, there's alternatives. And I think that's part of the problem is that, um, a lot of times in the medical field, they are so bought by big pharma that they're not allowed to tell you that there's an alternative. And unless you ask and demand what the alternative is and you do your own research, 
they're not going to provide that for you because they're not allowed to. They're already owned by Big Pharma. That's where my issue with Big Pharma is. I know that yeah. they save lives, but at the same time, it's gotten so much about the money. That's all they're looking at. Yeah, they're you know? not looking at people as people anymore. Whereas we, the everyday person, or that's my mom, that's mm -hmm. my sister, that's my grandmother. But Big Pharma is, that's a dollar sign. Exactly. Um, and the doctors, unfortunately, not... I don't want to generalize because there no, are some. Uh, there good are ones. some good ones, yeah. But a lot of doctors have also started to go the way of you're a dollar sign, mm -hmm. you're not a person anymore. Mm -hmm. My sister um, has gotten to that point where she has um, PCOS, mm -hmm. and she, one of the doctors, told her to get onto a medication that she knew was causing liver damage because her dad was on that same medication. Mm. And so she went to the doctor and said, I know that this medication causes this, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be on it for the rest of my life. Uh, it's just going to lead to more things. And when she started calling the doctor out and saying, well, I did research, and actually I can treat it with diet, when she said that, that's when a doctor turns around and said, oh, yes, okay, and let me also tell you this. Mm -hmm. But it's only when you when get to that said, point where mm -hmm. you're like, no, 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 I've done research, and I know I can treat it this way, that's when, and I really wish, like you just said, more doctors would go back to saying, okay, listen, you could go this way and mm -hmm. you could do the pills, but you're going to have this, this, and this if you do. Or, I, like, I, I'm a big fan of options. Yes. And that's, like, with my, that's why I named my film I Chose Life, because right. I options. realized that it, life is a choice and mm -hmm. so is suicide. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so is choosing to take medication or choosing not to. Mm -hmm. Um, my first film was called Beautiful Births, and it's about, you know, I wanted women to know they had options. I didn't want to demonize the medical industry. Um, Ricky Lake did a great job of doing that in her mm -hmm. film, The Business of Being Born. But my film was more, okay, well, this is what she did, and she did great and made a great impact. But she didn't talk about the midwifery model of care. So let me focus on that and let women know they have options. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about options and choices, and I wish doctors would let people know, okay, you could have the pills mm -hmm. and this is what it's going to do to you mm -hmm. and this is how long it's going to take or you could change your diet or you could whatever different things. Um, when I was doing the suicide documentary, mm -hmm. I found out that UCLA, um, aside from talk therapy and aside from pills, they're actually working with frequencies mm -hmm. and how to actually rewire your brain and it's a really, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of fascinated by that research. Like, oh, so there's another way because right. some people, they do have a genuine chemical imbalance or, or something's just wired wrong in mm -hmm. their brain or not wrong, but just not wired the way that everyone else is. Right. And if we can fix that without chemical medication mm -hmm. that causes side effects, and, you know, talk therapy isn't going to work for everybody, mm -hmm. just like chemical medication isn't going to work for everyone. So I think there's finding new and innovative ways is really fascinating. So I love the, the research that UCLA is doing. And Absolutely. I know that um, my uh, co-producer partner, um, Kathy, she works for a company uh, where they deal with CBD. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think THC as well, but mainly her, she's on the CBD side of it. And she would tell me, because I, I suffer for migraines. I get them quite, you know, often. And so she would tell me, like, you should do CBD. I'm the type of person that um, I have, like, a, I, I like to have control, right? right. So I, I'm that person that never has done any, any. I'm straight edge is what they call me. Awesome. Because, yeah. Because <laughs> I get, I have a fear of losing the control, not having control of what I want to do whether it's right or wrong, I want to have the control. I want to know what I'm doing. And so when I see someone that's high, I know they don't have control mm -hmm. and I don't want to be that person, you know? So it's like, it, it, it's weird to say it's, it's a control issue. I know that's what it is, but I know how to balance it. So that's why I, I'm really skeptical when it comes to drugs. So recreational drugs, even drugs that are prescribed i'm really like what is this gonna like am i gonna lose any control am i you know and so um she told me try the cbd and i i she gave me in a pill form because i've never smoked in my life and so she gave me a, a vape pen and i was like i don't know what to do with this because i've never smoked so she's like here's a pill and it's supernatural it won't even come up in your system like there's nothing wrong with it so she was telling me i i'm 
I used to be kind of like anti-marijuana, if you will, for the high reasons. But then as I did research for it, I realized there's a lot of good things from it. A lot of good things. And I, there's different ways of using it, just like in anything. Yeah. Right. So I became an advocate where if it's good for you and it's natural, do it. You know, like I ha I tell my mom all the time now and she's I got it a little bit from her because she's like, I don't do drugs, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, OK, I'm the same as my mom. So mm -hmm. I totally get that. I, I wonder if she's got the same control things that I do. Um, but in that aspect, I'm not telling my mom, try the CBD pill. And she's tried it and it's helped her. You know, so she sometimes says like, okay, I'll, I'll use it now. So sometimes it, it does help. I usually before I, I go to sleep because it makes me drowsy. So that's right. when I do it, you know. But other than that, I realize now that I become like more open-minded in that sense because I know, I know the reasons why I didn't do it, but I understand the good reasons behind them. Does that make sense? Oh, like, yeah, absolutely. I think I think plant-based medicines are definitely worth uh, looking more into. Mm -hmm. Like in the last couple of years, I knew three years ago, I knew nothing about aromatherapy. Mm -hmm. And about two years ago, I am, I started to look into it and, and get into it. And that's also plant-based. And, mm -hmm. um, and I started recommending CBD oil to my parents who, mm -hmm. you know, my stepdad was a Vietnam vet, very anti-marijuana my whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't even tell you the trouble I got into when I came home with a joint in high school. <laughs> My God. But <laughs> CBD, I yeah. you know, went to them and said, listen, it's not psychoactive. It will not make you high. Um, and he tried it and they, because he had some leg pain and uh, his opiates weren't working and none of his pain medications that were prescribed to him were mm -hmm. working. And so my mom had called me up the next day and told me that, my stepdad woke up in really bad pain, and she rubbed the CBD cream on his legs, and within minutes, he was feeling relief. And I was like, good. I'm so it's glad to hear it because, yeah. you know, if I had said, try marijuana for anything, <laughs> it would have been like, no, yeah. that's the devil. That, no. Yeah. <laughs> like, but CBD is like mm -hmm. a whole different animal because it's not psychoactive. So no one has to worry about losing any control. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that plant medicines are now being explored. And, and that's why I was going into like aromatherapy because mm -hmm. one of my kids has asthma. Now, he doesn't have chronic, everyday, really bad, put you in the hospital asthma. Right. His asthma is pretty mild. And it, we've noticed, we can I can predict it like clockwork now because it only happens when the weather changes, mm -hmm. when it becomes really hot or really cold. And he only has it for like two or three days while his body adjusts to the new temperatures. And okay. that's it. Um, but we found that when he was on the inhaler, and the doctors would warn me, the doctors said, you know, this is steroids, so be careful because it will weaken his immune system. If he was, one of the doctors actually said if my kid was to catch chicken pox while using the inhaler, that he could, it could be so severe he could die because Jeez. it would weaken the immune system that bad. So careful with the, so that, that's kind of what went into my head was careful with the steroids. So right. of course with what I had already told you about seeing my grandmother grow up with not using that medication. Um, and that's what we'd used like his whole life was mm -hmm. the inhaler since he was like five. And then I had read some stuff about um, aromatherapy and mm -hmm. we tried eucalyptus oil mm -hmm. and a diffuser and breathing that and breathing in steam. And now when he has asthma and he will tell you the difference himself, the inhaler would take him two weeks to feel better Using essential oils takes three days, yeah, and wow. there's no side effects. And with the inhaler, he would feel really bad, and he would mm -hmm. be side. So it would be like he'd be down for like a month between just the inhaler making him feel bad, mm -hmm. and then recovering from the inhaler. Like the asthma would make him feel bad, and then recover yeah. from the inhaler. So he'd be down for a month when he was using the inhaler. Um, whereas now he's down for like three days. Okay. Yeah. That's and a huge difference. Huge difference. <laughs> and for him as a kid, it's, you know, it's wonders for him. It's yeah. been a huge, so, and he loves to tell people now he's like, he still doesn't love the smell of eucalyptus because mm -hmm. it smells like medicine because mm -hmm. they actually use eucalyptus in our, in big pharma medicines. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's the thing of it too. When you look at big pharma medicines, a lot of times they are making synthetic versions oh, yeah. of what nature has already given to us. It, what's the point? <laughs> so I'm just like, why can't we bypass that and go to nature? Right. Um, and when we can. And right. obviously there's going to be times when someone breaks a bone and you got to go and right, use of Western course. medicine. There's... But 
I feel, I feel like there needs to be a balance. I, I, exactly, because I'm not about. anti it, but it's like too much can be too much. Yeah. That's just all it is. Um, One of my mentors has a great saying that um, East meets West is the best because, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and it really, that's even what I found, and that's what a lot of holistic practitioners believe as well, mm-hmm. is that, you know, East meets West is the best because we need a balance and yes. we're so out of balance right now, I feel like in so many ways. Oh, yeah. I was at a... I was filming and it was too hot so I got a combination of a heat stroke and a migraine and I get them you know depending because you know so I ended up at the hospital so I'm at the hospital and they gave me something and I'll never forget this um my mind was fully alert like I you know but then I could feel my body and everything shutting down like it was forcing me to sleep but how could I sleep when my mind was awake and it was the weirdest feeling ever. I start freaking out. Like my chest started feeling like it was pounding. And I, I told my friend who was, who took me to the hospital, I was like, this isn't, something's wrong. Like I feel like my chest feels warm. I feel like it's pounding out of my, like my heart's going to pound out of my chest. Like it's bad. And so she called the doctor and the doctor's like, oh, it's normal. And I, and I was trying to talk and I, could hear myself slurring like I was like uh, uh, and she was like what are you trying to say and I was telling her I, I can't talk but I'm awake and so she's like you can't talk like she was like trying to make out the words that I was saying and so she told the, the doctor again he's like it's it's normal it's the medication and I was freaking out because my mind was so alert but every I couldn't control the fact that I was crashing like like crashing meaning like I was I was falling hard into like a forced sleep mm-hmm. you know so it's kind of like when they give you something before a surgery type of thing but you you're aware of it so you start they tell you do the count count backwards I, I don't know what's that buzzing sound so I was doing the count backwards I was doing that and uh that helps but this I couldn't count backwards there's just no I was fully aware of what's happening and everything was just shutting like my eyes I couldn't keep open I couldn't even control my breathing because I was going through that the way you breathe when you're asleep. So I was just like, what is happening? I did not like that feeling at all. Yeah, I I don't blame you. I don't either. That's that's why whenever I can avoid Western medicine, I mm-hmm. do because I don't like that feeling either. Yeah, it's it's not good. Like I, you know, it's. Yeah, I feel like we need to find other ways, better ways. Yeah, to, to I, I know them. there's got to be an alternative, you know, and at that point, because I was out of it, like when they they carried me into the hospital. So I didn't come through to until they, she told me that they, they broke two packets of the smelling salt because the first one didn't do anything and the second one really jolted me. Mm. And they're like, ah, she's awake, you know, and um, they connected me, hooked me up and did all these tests and I was like sort of out of it. But when they injected me with whatever it was they said it was for the migraine um they said it was a combination of two things i don't remember but i just remember i did not like that feeling because i i at that point like i was over the heat stroke i was over the migraine even though it was slightly there it became a headache at this point right i was just like what is happening because i was fully awake i could hear things i could and i couldn't move like i that's scary yeah <laughs> it was like i imagine that's what um it, it must be like for someone to take like a date rape type of pill that's what it felt like you know it was like really i didn't that's why i don't like losing the control right no i don't blame you it's really scary to think of what people could do to your body when you're mm-hmm. when you can't control it it's yeah it's it's terrifying yeah <laughs> now we, we we went really deep into that i i didn't want to ask... think of making a horror movie now all about this stuff right <laughs> um that's your next project right? uh, <laughs> What's, uh, now you, you do, um, you're a journalist. So I'm, I'm not a journalist per se, per but se. I do write for film and clay. Okay. So. But sort of like it though. Yeah, sort of I like, like well, it. Well, <laughs> I like to, I like to really write about and interview female mm-hmm. filmmakers and review their films mm-hmm. and try to give them the spotlight that I feel like they need because I feel like, um, there are so many talented women mm-hmm. and I love discovering them. It's really funny. There's. One movie that I had stumbled upon, uh, on Am- I'd watched it on Amazon Prime, mm-hmm. and it was called Odd Brodsky. Okay. And I thought it was directed by a woman, produced by women, uh, co-written by a woman. So I was like, oh, I got to see this. It was really funny. Is like months later, 
turns out that one of the producers and the director are my Facebook friends. Oh, really? And I was like, like I'm seeing them talk about this movie. I'm like, wait a second. I loved that movie. I watched that movie. Yeah. Now I want to write a review about it for Film and Korea. Like, it was so good. So, um, and I feel like there are so many gems like that. They yeah. are just, we just don't know about them. Right. So what can I do to help? Yeah, I am a female filmmaker, so I know the struggle of yeah. how hard it is. So how can I, as a writer, do your part? help other women yeah. get their projects seen and get the attention that I feel they deserve? Absolutely. So, I mean, that's, yeah, that's one of the other things. That's that really do. cool that you're doing that because, ironically, I, uh, a couple of shows ago, um, episodes ago on this podcast, I was talking to uh, Sarita. Um, she has her own production company, and she's super... Uh, supportive as well of, of filmmakers and, and whatnot and, and so obviously since she has her production company but um, I, I was telling her the one platform that I noticed that we lack especially as in, in independent filmmaking is PR um, because it, it is a lot of work it, it's a lot of work and then a lot of work to for nothing basically uh, and it sucks to say that because your PR goes as far as your your whoever your followers are on social media so you can put that out there as much as you can you can write your own blogs as much as you can and, and self-promote as much as you can but if no one else is taking the incentive to help you do outside of your circle then that's as far as it's going to go within your inner circle and i told her i was like i wish there was more pr more pr people firms um publicists or firms that are open and have a part for independent filmmakers because um, I try to do uh, press releases and say, here's this project and I, I know how to write a press release and I send it out. And sometimes they, I get a bite and most of the times we don't because it's kind of like, who are you? And they put it to the side. So if you have a publicist doing that and they already have the links and the know-how, then that's amazing because then you, you get outside of that and you get um, more people involved in knowing who you are and what your project is you should go to lunch with me and we'll talk more about this too because <laughs> yeah. i had to yeah I, so i had a pr nightmare now that you're talking about this i actually can i can we talk about this yeah, yeah. on, on yeah. air because i know that there are going to be so many other women mm -hmm. who are dealing like pr can be a real nightmare for filmmakers mm -hmm. like and, and that's part of what inspired me when i originally started the miss vision podcast i told you about that is mm -hmm. right now not doing anything it's kind of defunct at the moment um but like the reason that I really wanted to seek out other women to talk to is I knew how to make a movie. Mm -hmm. I went through film school. Mm -hmm. I had put all the pieces together. The movie was done. And then when, when my first film was done and I made the movie, I was like, okay, well now what? Right now, how do I get it out to my audience? And because it was on a niche subject, it was about childbirth. So mm -hmm. it's called beautiful births. Um, I knew who my audience was. So I thought, okay, great. I can get this to the midwives. I can mm -hmm. reach out. So my sister and my mom and my grandmother compiled, they were my team, mm -hmm. and they compiled a list of literally every single midwife mm -hmm. and birth center in the United States from wow. every state, and mm -hmm. then they went to every county. Wow. So I have a binder that is like four or five inches thick. That is like a phone book. Like, yeah, <laughs> there's literally every birth center and independent midwife that we could find that was listed yeah. in America. Wow. And so I was like, okay, well, this is my audience, so we can reach out to them directly. Mm -hmm. um, some of them we emailed, and, and I assume that some of the emails went to the spam folder because right. it's like, who is this? You right. Know? Um, but some people did respond. And so within that community, I was able to get my film out but mm -hmm. then i was like okay but now i want to get it to the mainstream i right. want to get it to i want every woman in america who's going to deal with pregnancy because not to every woman it. is yeah but every yeah. woman who is going to deal with pregnancy i want all of them to watch it i want it on lifetime i want mm -hmm. it on oxygen i want it on pbs i want it available to the mainstream everyday woman to let her know she has options because mm -hmm. most what i found when people would watch my film most women would say, I didn't even know I had a choice outside of the mainstream medical hospital birthing system. I didn't know that this was an option. Right. I didn't know I could have a water baby. Like, right. you know, and so I just wanted, like, I don't really care. I don't judge. I had a baby. I had babies in the hospital. I had babies outside the hospital. I had right. a C-section. 
I've had birth every way you can imagine it. So I don't judge people on their birth choices. I just want them to know that they have, have choices. choices. Yep. And to me, that was important. So, yeah. um, so then trying to do that, I hired a PR firm based out of Texas that I'm not going to go into their name because I don't want to, I don't want to um, mm. trash talk anybody. No, no, no. But, um, but they turned out to be pretty bogus anyway. Okay. So it's like you look at their website and it's all flashy and has yeah. these big names. But then when you try to actually research them and locate them, they don't actually exist. It's all BS, yeah. basically. Yeah. They stole $15,000 from – this was the budget that I'd had for PR. And they actually took more like – I was paying more for them a month than what I pay in my rent. Like, it was Jeez. ridiculous. And in return, I was not given what I was guaranteed. What they guaranteed me was X amount of press releases. They did like half of those. Well, and here's the thing about press releases that I've learned. Mm -hmm. um, Newswire, it's really expensive, mm -hmm. but it's worth it. Um, mm -hmm. There's a company called Cision and Newswire, and when you purchase their software, so they'll they're all, they're the ones who will get your press release out to everybody. Everyone, okay. Um, like Good ABC, NBC. Okay. So we'll we'll go to lunch, and I'll I'll yeah. teach you all. I'll tell you all of the tips and tricks that I learned about this. But in fact, maybe. Maybe we'll do a workshop on yeah, it for I think female that's, filmmakers. That's what I'm thinking. We should do that. Because I've learned a lot. And then um, I ended up doing, I'll show you my website where I'll show you all the PR that I did get on my own once I fired this company. Okay. Um, because I, that's what I learned. They were only they were only reaching out to bloggers, and I wanted mainstream press. Yeah. And why am I paying you this much money if I can reach out to bloggers, bloggers myself? Yeah. yeah. So... And the people I couldn't reach were like, I wanted to be on Ellen. I wanted, you know, women, mm -hmm. I wanted to yeah. be in front of women. And yeah. I know women watch Ellen and women watch all these different shows. So how can I get in front of these people? This is who I want to be my audience. Exactly. And, and I was just getting like uh, brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. Even this PR company didn't have those connections that they said they did. Mm. So when it comes to publicists, like you really kind of go, you got to go with somebody who's like tied in with the mainstream yeah. studios or if you're going to DIY, which th that's still where I'm at as an independent yeah. artist. Um, if you're going to DIY, then it's worth it to save up like a thousand bucks and go with Newswire. Okay. Um, because that's going to get your, your press release out to everybody. Everyone. And then you can, with Newswire, they have it set up where you get like a newsroom. Okay. So you could actually then follow up with, oh, hey, your publication picked up my press release. Would you be interested in then doing an interview with me? Okay. Or talking to me or learning more about what my company's event or whatever. Right. Whatever it happens to be. Yeah. But yeah, that's so that's a little thing that's, that I had to learn DIY on my own. No, that's great, and I think we will we'll, we should do that. We'll talk into that and, uh, further afterwards, and um, yeah, definitely something to put out there because I I think that's necessary for filmmakers, independent filmmakers. Um, and if you are, because I know you go to school, you study for that as well for for PR, and I know that there's a, a there's a, a way to do that, and there's people that are starting like they're beginners so that's what i'm saying like the ones that are beginning don't shut it down i'm not saying do it for free right but you'll be surprised if you reach out to the independent filmmakers and how many will go to you mm -hmm. and how that's going to also help your career as well so there's a way we can meet together yeah and help each other out that's all we're asking for and that's what i as because i write for film inquiry mm -hmm. whenever i see that i'm always reaching out to oh you have a project tell me about it let yeah, me exactly. interview you let me watch your film because i know how hard it is and, yes. and i know how hard it is to get that pr and there's there's a film that i watched recently it was not by a female filmmaker but it was about a woman who had bipolar disorder uh -huh. um it was actually on facebook in the documentary filmmakers page um this guy had posted a trailer to his film and and it just like sucked me in immediately. I was like, wow, I know this woman. Like, I don't know this woman, right. but I've known people like exactly that. like this person. And that trailer stuck with me for like three days. So I ended up like watching the, I bought the director's cut to uh -huh. watch his film because it wasn't released yet. Um, but it spoke to me so much. Like I was in tears. I watched it three times in a row. I was like, and you did a piece it on it felt. Yeah. And so I reached out to him and was like, I want to talk to you about your film. That's why I said, like, I mostly focus on women, That's great. but every once in a while I will see a film that just like grabs That's me. I'm it. like, wow, I need to talk to this guy no. or I need to focus on this film because it's amazing. And I feel like that's one of the things I, I really love ancient Egypt. One of the things I love about it is that men and women worked together. They understood yeah. that 
to have a great thriving society, women and men are both, we both uh, contribute great amounts. So yeah. I feel like that's really truly where our society is lacking. And if we can bring that to film where we have women and men working together and uh -huh. creating together uh -huh. and being allies, yeah, I feel like we'll go a lot farther. Absolutely, we gotta wrap it up unfortunately. Quickly, where can people find you? Uh, www.jackieblue.net and Jackie is J-A-C-Q-U-I. Thank you so much. Thank you for being our guest today. Everyone, please. Yes, absolutely. And I look forward to having you back again. Um, have a safe and fun weekend, uh, weekend, um, week and safe Sunday. You're listening to Female Filmmakers Fuse with Alexa Polar only on LA Talk Radio.